So I want to break our black hole discussion into two parts. I'll start by telling you about what is a black hole and what are its properties. And then we'll move on to how we can observe black holes. So a black hole in general is something that's more massive than a neutron star. And effectively what happens is if you put too much mass on a neutron star, more than three solar masses, then the neutron degeneracy pressure can no longer hold up to the gravity. So gravity just keeps pressing down. There's no other force that can push back against it. And so it just keeps pushing all the way. Um, so you can think of a black hole as a bunch of mass condensed into a zero amount of space. So it would have an infinite density. It would be what we would call a singularity in space where space is bent to its extreme. Um, all objects with mass bend space a little bit. So the sun bends space slightly. A white dwarf with more mass will bend space more. Neutron star with even more mass bends space even more. And then the black hole bends space all the way. So the properties of a black hole that are, you know, kind of within this singularity um, can't really be described by our normal physics. The overall bending of space-time is described by general relativity. Um, and so this is well understood, but what happens inside the black hole past what we call the event horizon, we cannot know. Um, any object could be a black hole if it was squished far enough down. So uh, it wouldn't happen that Earth would become a black hole because it's not massive enough. But if it were a black hole, it would be only 0.7 inches in diameter. So um, it's worth pointing out again, these mass limits uh, for the white dwarf is less than 1.4 times the mass of the sun and for the black hole greater than three times the mass of the sun. So you'll wanna keep these numbers in your back pocket. Um, and then remember it takes a, a star with much more than three solar masses to create a black hole because so much of the envelope is lost in the supernova explosion. All right, so I mentioned an event horizon and a size of a black hole. And so what does it mean to measure a black hole? Uh, well, effectively, as objects move throughout a bent space-time, they move along the bent fabric of space-time. Um, and if you have light that's traveling along that fabric, then it moves at a certain speed, uh, the speed of light. And for a normal object like Earth, if I shoot a, I don't know, a rocket ship off of Earth and exceed the escape velocity, which depends on the Earth's mass and radius, then it'll go into orbit. Um, but if I try to escape a black hole, um, I can do that if I'm outside the event horizon. But once I'm inside this specific location called the event horizon, then the escape velocity is higher than the speed of light. So nothing can escape, not even light, once it crosses that boundary. So the event horizon is what we mean when we say this, that a black hole has a certain size, even though all the mass is compressed into a single point of zero extent, the event horizon is, you know, a meaningful distance from the center of that crushed mass. So um, what do you suppose the event horizon sort of means? So I'm seeing most votes for B, but that place where space becomes infinitely bent is actually called the singularity. Um, the event horizon has a specific size and, oh, sorry, that is measured by the Schwarzschild radius. I skipped ahead, but I didn't mean to. So the Schwarzschild radius is the way that we describe the size of the black hole. Um, so that's the distance from the center. And then the event horizon is the actual like, you know, spherical location where if you got closer than that, then you cannot escape, even if you're light. All right, so I'm not gonna go into the details of the math on measuring the short child radius, but it's actually pretty um, simple physics. Uh, it's the same physics as you use to describe a rocket ship escaping a planet. So it just depends on the mass and the uh, radius or well, just the mass of the object, the Schwarzschild radius. Um, so I guess what this means is that if you had a smaller, um, a, a less massive black hole, 
its shortest child radius would be much closer to it. And so the event horizon would be close to the singularity. And for a more massive object, the event horizon is far from the singularity. And so you can't get very close to it before you can no longer escape. All right, so um, if you went near a black hole, like I think you just mentioned in the chat, Matthew McConaughey, if you have an indestructible space probe, so let's just suppose that, that this is what you have, you could send it toward a black hole and watch it as it approaches the event horizon. And let's suppose that your space probe is sending you out pulses of light. Let's say it's sending out pulses of blue light um, so that you can keep track of it as it goes closer. Um, they would actually redshift as it gets closer and closer to the event horizon because space is stretched. And so light has to overcome that stretched space and its wavelength becomes longer. So you would see a red light signal, even if the spaceship was sending out a blue light signal. And the amount that the light gets stretched would be uh, dependent on the mass of the black hole because a more massive black hole would stretch space more. Uh, once the rocket ship reached the event horizon, the, that redshift would become infinite because space would be infinitely stretched. And so you wouldn't be able to see any signal at all. So once the spaceship was within the black hole, um, you would no longer be able to receive any signals it sends. This also has another um, impact, which is if, you, if your probe was sending out regularly timed signals, you would see them spaced farther and farther apart in time as well, because space-time is a four-dimensional fabric. And so stretching space-time not only stretches space, which stretches the wavelength, but also stretches time, which would stretch the, the pulse timing that you would receive from your probe. Um, the probe itself, though, would not think anything was amiss. Uh, it would not experience any differences in time. And so this seems like kind of a conundrum, uh, but it's all part of the theory of relativity. So physics gets weird under these extreme conditions. Time becomes different for observers. Okay, but the reason we'd have to have an indestructible space probe is because you're in big trouble even way before you reach the event horizon. So um, because the force of gravity is dependent on distance, then any point that's nearby a massive object experiences a higher pull from gravity than its far end does. And so this causes, um, for example, the moons of Jupiter to be slightly squashed in a football shape uh, with the long axis pointing toward Jupiter. And this is called a tidal force. It's the same force that causes the water on Earth to be squished out uh, in the direction of the moon, and that's what causes our ocean tides. And so these tidal forces, if they become too extreme, then they can overcome the gravity and the electrostatic forces holding an object together and rip it apart. Um, so this can actually happen to moons around planets. If they stray too close, they can be ripped apart. Um, and this is, I guess, the same effect that if you got close to a black hole would cause you to stretch out into a spaghetti and eventually become ripped apart. So this, because it is an elongation effect, then the black hole community calls this process spaghettification, which is awesome. Move on here. So um, want to consider what a black hole does to nearby objects. So not objects near the event horizon, but objects farther away. So um, if the sun collapsed into a black hole, its event horizon wouldn't be very far from the sun. Um, but what do you think would happen to Earth? All right, I'm seeing mostly A and C. So I could give you a number. If the sun turned into a black hole, it's short's child radius, so the location of its event horizon from its center would be uh, about three kilometers. So much smaller than the sun currently is now. So you could go within three kilometers and still be able to escape. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily just pull everything in with its strong gravity. In fact, it has the same amount of gravity because it has the same amount of mass. So the only trouble with a black hole sun would be that it doesn't emit light. Otherwise, Earth would be unaffected 
it would continue along in its normal orbit, uh, but life on Earth would suffer without sunshine. This one, I just want to disabuse you of the notion that black holes just like go around space gobbling things up. They can gobble things up, but they don't do it all the time. They only do it when an uh, object comes too close to their event horizon. So we can observe black holes, which might sound weird because if a black hole doesn't emit any light of its own, and it also is an object from which light cannot escape, then it seems like how would you ever measure such an object? You could, yes, you can observe it by a lack of light. That is definitely one of the ways. So there's one other way, which is that sometimes a black hole does consume things, right? Um, particularly if a black hole is in a binary star system. And so like the high mass star has already become a black hole, but it has another partner nearby. Then um, it can actually siphon mass off of that star and create what we call an accretion disk. So the matter will funnel into the black hole along a disk shape. And this, um, the fast rotating matter around the black hole is essentially getting hot via friction as it rubs together. It gets so hot, in fact, that it emits X-ray radiation. And then the magnetic field of the black hole, similar to the pulsar, sends jets away along its uh, magnetic field axis, which for the black hole is aligned with its rotation axis. So we've actually seen this process uh, play out. This is Cygnus X1. Um, here it is in the optical. doesn't look like anything special. It's in that little red box, just a little dot of light. But in the X-ray, it looks very different. So when we look at it in the X-ray, it's very bright, whereas a normal star wouldn't be bright in the X-ray. It doesn't emit that high energy of light. And so this X-ray radiation was what we used to figure out that Cygnus X1 did contain a black hole. Um, Stephen Hawking thought that it did not contain a black hole and actually lost a bet on that. So that's pretty great. So um, over time, this blue supergiant will just lose more and more of its mass to the black hole. But otherwise, the black hole is not, like it is consuming its partner, sure, but it's not like wholesale pulling the entire star in. It's just slowly siphoning off um, the amount of mass that is getting close to it. And this wouldn't happen unless this partner star was go undergoing a giant process, because that's the only reason its um, envelope of gas will get close enough to the black hole uh, for this to matter. And this is this whole accretion disk is outside of the event horizon. So in our artist's rendition here, it's like this dark part at the middle, that would be the black hole. So you could look for this dark shadow, but you can also look for the X-ray emission from this bright accretion disk. Well, if so for this one in particular, since it is a blue supergiant star, eventually it will go supernova unless it loses too much mass first, in which case it'll probably become a uh, white dwarf star. So the, you know, the core of this star has some particular fate. I don't know what the partner's mass is, but it will either become a neutron star or a black hole if it's massive enough, or it will become a white dwarf if it loses too much mass in this process. And then once it's um, a white dwarf star, that core is going to be way too far from the black hole um, to be pulled toward it in any meaningful way. Uh, binary stars orbit a common center of gravity in the first place. And so it, they'll just live in this situation for the rest of their lives. It's possible that they can spiral together over time. And then if that happens, then they'll merge. And what will be left is a more massive black hole. Um, but that would be, that process is not something that happens immediately. That happens slowly over time. All right, so what I just told you about was a stellar mass black hole, meaning it's a black hole that has about the same mass as a star, because that's where it came from. Um, but we also have supermassive black holes, which are many, many times the mass of a normal black hole, three solar masses. Um, so these supermassive black holes, they typically exist at galactic centers. And the reason that we think that they occur at galactic centers is just what I described. Sometimes black holes could merge with the other remnants of stars or with other black holes. The galactic center is very crowded. So there's plenty of stellar remnants to, that can, you know, basically collide with each other and merge together. And so the black holes just get more and more massive over time as more and more objects merge together with them. 
And these can emit jets of matter along their rotation axis in the same way to pulsars. So that's what we're seeing here. This is M87. It's at the center of not our galaxy, a different galaxy. And if we uh, zoom in on M87, uh, we can actually look for the black hole itself. And here is its picture. So this is the first direct image ever taken of a black hole. Usually we can only see them because of their X-ray emissions from accretion disks. Um, but this Event Horizon Telescope was an array of teles radio telescopes all over planet Earth. And using some very clever mathematics, they were able to stitch together the signals from many of them. And so instead of just having like a single small radio telescope, it's as if we had a planet Earth-sized radio telescope. Uh, and so what we're looking at here are uh, radio emissions from gas that's being bent. Um, so the, the radio emissions are being bent. Uh, you can see a little bit of the curvature. And then this dark shadow at the center, that's our black hole. So this was 2019, uh, extremely exciting announcement. And this publication has like hundreds of authors because it's such a big collaboration of radio telescope operators from around the world. All right, so this bending of light along the stretched space-time near the black hole is called gravitational lensing. And in this um, simulation that we're looking at here, um, this is what's causing the surrounding um, gas of, this is supposed to be like the dust of the Milky Way. And this is the dust being warped around the black hole. So we could conceivably also detect black holes this way by looking for objects whose light is being bent around the black hole. Um, but in practice, that has, it has never been observed. So it's worth saying the matter itself here is not being bent. It's only like the light is coming from behind the black hole and then it bends around the black hole. So from our perspective, it looks like it's been um, stretched out into a ring. This idea of gravitational lensing, we actually use it um, for galaxies to measure the mass of, of galaxies as starlight bends around them. Okay, and then the last direct piece of observational evidence we have for black holes is called gravitational waves. This is very um, new in the world of physics. I think the LIGO collaboration observed their first gravitational wave, oh yes, in 2017. And what they measured here was a black hole, black hole merger. When a black hole merges with another black hole, there's two regions of extremely bent space time that then merge together. And it's basically like the, the merger produces a ripple in the rest of space time that, that propagates away from it. So it's like dropping a pebble in a pond, it produces a ripple. And we can actually measure the uh, small changes of gravity as this stretching of space-time ripples out toward us. Um, it requires a, a very enormous detector located in two different places to confirm that this is what we measure. Okay, so those blips that you heard are the changing frequency of the ripple in space time. So this signal is plotted over time, and then this is a frequency axis. So a higher frequency is a higher pitch of sound. And so we can actually play these signals directly as sound, and uh, you can hear the frequency of the rippling space time go higher as the uh, final um, in spiral of these black holes happens. So um, we've also measured gravitational waves from mergers between neutron stars and black holes, and I think between neutron stars and other neutron stars. And so this is a really exciting way, a new way that we have to uh, measure binary systems as they evolve in time together. And then we can actually point our telescopes there. The gravity signal gets here first before the um, light signal in, in most cases. And so we can actually point our telescopes toward an interesting event and see what happens. <laughs> 